Welcome, everybody. I'm Allison Brown, president of League of Women Voters Falls Church, and we're very happy to have you all with us today for a conversation with Delegate Marcus Simon. It'll certainly be an interesting legislative session coming up in January, and um, we're looking forward to hearing Delegate Simon tell us uh, what he expects and what he's going to be working on. And um, I also want to um, welcome City of Falls Church Council Member Phil Duncan, who's joining us today. So um, with that, um, we will get started and I will turn it over to Delegate Simon. And there will be plenty of time for questions. Um, um, so please think of your questions and um, we'll have um, plenty of time for questions. You're welcome to put them in the chat as we're going um, or we have a small enough group um, when Delegate Simon is done with his initial remarks. If you wanna unmute and ask your question, that's fine. Yeah, I think it's an intimate enough group here initially that you guys can just shout it out. I think I know most of you guys pretty well. So uh, feel free to interrupt me with questions or, or wait for a pause, a pregnant pause, and just jump on in. So um, thank you to the League for putting this on and creating this opportunity for me. Um, I, I, I was hoping that by now we'd all be able to get together sort of safely in person and not have to be uh, this concerned. But with uh, the winter surge, the post-Thanksgiving, um, uh, you know, increase in, in um, incidence of COVID and hospitalizations. I know that's uh, affecting this area immediately. Was on, I was, was on a call with Innova Fairfax last week, getting their legislative preview and update. And uh, they had uh, had a tremendous increase in the number of hospitalizations uh, just in the last couple of weeks. And, and we're sort of at that point um, where you'd expect to be frankly with people that were infected over the Thanksgiving holidays, having their disease possessed, progress to the point where they need hospitalization. That sort of started hitting last week and continues to roll ahead. So we're not immune to that. Uh, Virginia had its first case of Omicron identified. I doubt it's the only case that's out there. So uh, you know, the, the pandemic continues to be uh, a challenge for everybody. I know we'd love to just be able to put it behind us, but unfortunately we can't. But all that said, I'm glad to be here with you all uh, and participate this way. It gives me the advantage of still being in my pajama pants. Um, on a Sunday, even late in the afternoon while I talk to you guys. Um, let me start with, I think, uh, the, the question, the opening question about, you know, what the legislative, the legislative session holds. Um, I guess my one quibble would be with the intro is that I don't know that it'll be interesting. I think it's probably going to be kind of boring. Um, and that's just sort of a natural uh, side effect of divided government. Um, so as you all know, the, uh, re the election results were Fine for me. I mean, I got 72% of the vote and that was nice, but not exactly what I was hoping for uh, on a statewide basis. And so we've got a Republican uh, in the governor's mansion. Um, we've got the tie-breaking vote in the event that we lose a Democratic vote that the Senate could easily, you know, have a, a with some Sears uh, break a tie. Um, and we went from 55 uh, to 45 member Democratic majority in the House to a 48 to 52 minority. So uh, we have the, the, the Senate you know, still in Democratic control, albeit by a narrow margin, uh, but probably the margins are small enough in both the House and the Senate that folks won't probably try to push anything through that's too um, challenging or difficult uh, to get out. Um, the Senate, as close as it is uh, in numbers, um, you know, we have the benefit of being control of all the committee chairs and the committee breakdowns. So, um, you know, although you know, there's this looming threat that uh, you know, something, if something gets to the floor, we know we have some more conservative Democratic members of the, the House of the Senate on the Democratic side. Um, so the key to, to, to killing bills, to be honest, is to, to keep them bottled up in committees. And so that's what's likely to happen uh, in the Senate. So all that being said, it's going to be really difficult to pass bills and get them signed into law uh, this session. Uh, it'd be hard for Senate folks to get their bills out of the House, but hard for House hard for House folks to get their bills out of the Senate. And you know, the governor certainly can veto anything that, that us Democrats like to, too too much. So when we, we were in a similar situation, you know, in 2018 and 19, uh, and with the exception of Medicaid expansion, which became a big breakthrough because it's something that had been bottled up for for, for years and years and years, uh, not a lot happened. Um, you know, everything kind of you know 
the, 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 the governor is going to veto anything that the, uh, the Republicans could have gotten through with their narrow majorities. Um, and a lot of stuff didn't even make it out onto the floor because they couldn't get all the votes they needed for it. So I suspect on a macro level, on a large scale level, uh, the Republicans will do their best not to even introduce uh, some bills in really controversial areas that have no chance of passing um, and risk uh, firing up the Democratic base, right? And if we saw the election that we just went through, the, the difference in outcome is attributed mostly to greater intensity on the Republican side. Um, you know, interestingly enough, Democrats turned out, we have more Democrats show up or more people showed up to vote Democrat in a governor's election than ever before. Right? We've had more people vote in an odd year governor's race on the Democratic side than ever before, but not as many as on the Republican side. Um, and so, you know, what the Republicans want is they want to keep our intensity down while keeping their intensity up, but what's the balancing there, right? And so, um, you know, one of the questions I think that you guys wanted to sort of think about, and I, everybody's thinking about, is given the, the likelihood uh, that Roe versus Wade, if, if won't be overturned completely, will be greatly weakened uh, by the Supreme Court in the next several months, and that already, um, you know, the Supreme Court has declined to stay uh, bills like the Texas abortion bill, which allows a private right of action for, for private citizens to, to try and prevent uh, women from exercising their constitutional right, in my view, uh, to an abortion. Um, you know, will we see a similar effort? Will we see a Texas bill in Virginia? Will we see a Mississippi heartbeat bill in Virginia? And I, I think the answer is that they'll probably be introduced. I mean, it's going to be hard for the, de the Republican leadership to be exercise that much discipline over their members that nobody even tries to put it in. But I, I, I envision it just going to the Rules Committee uh, and never being docketed, never being heard, uh, because I don't think uh, it certainly won't pass the Senate. There's no way at all that Janet Howell and Dick Saslaw will allow that bill uh, to get through the Senate. And they're experienced enough and, and knowledgeable enough to keep it off the floor and keep that from, from going to the governor's desk. So on the other hand, you know, the, the more real the threat of, of actual legislation uh, to limit women's, you know, control over their bodies is, uh, the more fired up you know, a Democratic base would be over that issue. And so I think, particularly without knowing whether they're going to have to run again, which would be another topic we can talk about in a minute, um, this year or even next, uh, I think Republicans will try and keep that bottled up. Um, I think their focus is going to be on education. Uh, I think that uh, Democrats... Um, are frustrated and disappointed uh, that Republicans seem to have managed to message an education agenda to their advantage uh, in this last election. That's typically been a very democratic issue. Hey, we're the education party. We support teachers in public education. We want every kid to succeed. Um, and we, we sort of lost the messaging war on that. Uh, again, not that it wasn't close. It was a 50.5 to 49.5. It was as close a almost the you know, margin as you could get, but there is momentum seems to be on the, on the other side. So I think we'll try and grab that momentum back. I think the governor's already, uh, Governor Northam, our outgoing governor's already uh, helped set us up for success there by introducing a budget that's going to have a 10% teacher pay raise. And I know uh, uh, Councilman Duncan and Councilman Hiscott are on and like, yeah, but we have to match that too. So give us some money to help with that. Uh, and so we'll work on making sure that, that, that it's not too burdensome on the localities to actually make the give the raise with, and, you know, and be able to, to, to maintain uh, effort and and, um, and hit your part of the match. But but we're going to have you know, money for teachers, money for public schools, money in the classroom. Uh, and then if Governor Youngkin wants to um, take that money and put it for charter schools, we'll be able to watch, have to see him take it right out of the public schools. Or if he wants to cut taxes and give a tax rebate, um, I think by setting up a budget that shows um, how we're spending on, on real high priorities for a lot of Virginians, the Republicans have a tough choice to make over what programs do they want to gut to pay for uh, repealing the grocery tax, for instance, or to pay for uh, a tax rebate or to pay for these charter schools that, that uh, the folks on the right seem so interested in. So, yeah, I, I think that's going to be a part of the battle. I mean, we do have uh, Democrats who are not completely opposed to charter schools generally and, and public charter schools. In fact, in some ways, our governor's schools in Virginia operate a lot like um, public charters where, where you've got uh, magnets and, and you know science and tech and engineering like the, like Thomas Jefferson 
And there are other governor schools around the state that do some of those things. Um, but we want to keep it, you know, we, we believe big as a party, believe in public schools, strong public schools. Let's fully fund our public schools first to make sure every public school has all the resources it needs before we start taking any money out uh, to, 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 do, uh, to experiment with things like charter schools or privatizing the school system. So that'll be a big sort of pitched battle, I, I suspect. Um, I, I think it's going to be interesting to watch what happens with the budget. So you know, we're at 48 uh, Democrats to 52 Republicans, um, but they've got some new members that are um, very, very much in the Lauren Boebert, Marjorie Taylor Greene kind of, you know, cut from that cloth. Um, you know, uh, Delegate Poindexter, one of our long serving Republicans from very, very conservative guy, uh, got up and gave impassioned speeches in defense of Confederate monuments every year. Um, you know, put in bills to keep us from joining the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Was as conservative as, as you could imagine. Um, Yet he committed the heresy of suggesting that the election in Virginia was free and fair uh, from, you know, any kind of you know, chicanery. And that was enough. That was an apostasy. That was enough to get him to lose his primary. So um, even a conservative like like Mr. Poindexter lost. And so those are the he's being replaced again with somebody who's more in that Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene kind of um, wing of the Republican Party, which is to say. Republicans have a 52-48, so four vote swing, but two votes that they can lose, three votes they can lose, two votes really, uh, and they need to pass a budget. Uh, this is our budget year, we're in our biennial budget year, and they need to give a budget to the governor to sign. And I suspect there are at least a half dozen members of the Republican caucus that will not sign, uh, will not vote yes on anything that resembles a responsible state budget. Uh, and so I think Republicans will need Democratic votes uh, to get a budget through the House of Delegates. So one of the questions was, are there any opportunities for, for compromise? Um, I think on, on big issues, you know, I don't think you're going to see a gun violence prevention or gun control compromise. I don't, you know, I have a bill of my own on ghost guns. You, you, we talk about my, my legislative priorities. I'm going to put it back in again this year, but I don't expect it to get very far in a Republican controlled House of Delegates, even with 52. Uh, they've got more than enough votes there. To, um, to make sure that we don't do anything on guns or gun violence prevention. Um, but they, the budget's a must pass bill and it contains a lot of opportunities uh, for, for us to, to enact good measures and, and to, to show, to show you know, Virginians what our priorities are, right? That's what a budget document does. So that'll be, I think the area will, will, there will need to be compromise um, and how much leverage we are able to, um, to, get, to, to, to get from their need for our votes. Uh, will be something to watch for. Uh, yeah, I've been preaching at all these caucus meetings. I was telling earlier, I was telling some of the folks, I've got to hop from this to a caucus Zoom because uh, we're getting ready for the upcoming session. And my mantra is, if we stick together, right? Don't let them pick us off. If they can pick off six votes here by offering something for this district, something for that district, then we don't get nearly as much as if we all stick together as a group of 48 and say, you don't get any of our votes unless these democratic priorities are included in the budget. So that's that's what I'm hoping will happen with the budget. We'll see. Um, but I think that's our area for compromise. And that's our area um, to address some outstanding needs. We've got, we're in the best, I mean, Glenn Youngkin in many, many ways um, could be described as one of the luckiest men on earth. Um, but he is one of the luckiest politicians ever to, to be coming into office at a time when Virginia has unprecedented um, budget situation. We have a surplus like we've never had before, orders of magnitude higher. Um, it, it breaks some of the formulas for, for Medicaid spending and things like that. It's just, you know, they've never seen this much extra money um, flying around, which is a product of the American Rescue Plan, uh, some of the austerity that we put into place at the beginning of the pandemic, not knowing what that would do to revenues, the health of the economy and growth and so forth. So uh, we've got a lot of funds that the budget's going to be really where the action is um, this time. And we want to make sure too, we're going to be careful and responsible about it. And I know that Phil and Debbie understand this issue is that a lot of those are one-time funds. And so you don't want to build them into the base of your budget, but it gives you an opportunity to fix things. Uh, so hopefully we can have some money for things like stormwater improvements, right? Which are a one-time infrastructure kind of expense that we can spend. I know that's a big issue here in Falls Church City and around Fairfax County. So looking for ways to spend money uh, responsibly, and, and but, but in ways that aren't going to recur every year because we know we're not going to be in this budget situation every two years. Um, 
So that's sort of the big picture stuff. Um, as for my uh, legislative priorities, um, I am trying not to have many uh, because uh, I want to be realistic about what prospects are uh, given the climate. And, you know, I said, just I said, Republicans aren't going to get a whole lot of stuff through. Democrats will get even less um, as far as our priorities are. So focusing on uh, bread and butter things and, and common sense things. Uh, I think we've got a charter change for the city of Falls Church that we need to get done. Um, to take care of some things. So I will, I will certainly carry that and make sure we, we can get that taken care of to help um, non-citizens, so therefore not necessarily eligible voters, but residents of the city to participate uh, on, on committees uh, and citizen advisory boards and so forth. I think is a, something that ought to be fairly non-controversial. I mean, somebody will, I'm sure will, will, will attract some no votes um, to the extent that it involves immigration and people that are new Americans. And so, um, yeah, there'll be some folks that won't want their full participation in civic life, but hopefully, generally, these types of uh, charter local option charter changes are fairly non-controversial. Um, and beyond that, if I've got something that really needs to get done, I may give it to somebody else uh, because I do. Um, some of you may remember if you followed my career at all. Um, when we were in the minority, I was one of the um, more outspoken antagonists of the Republican majority. That's just sort of the role uh, that, that I was tapped to play, and one frankly I enjoyed like to think I'm sort of good at. Um, and when I was in the majority, I was the enforcer, right? And so um, frequently uh, when bills got to the floor that needed to go back to committee or needed to die a, a quiet death or maybe sometimes a not so quiet death, the speaker often turned to me um, to use my knowledge of the rules and procedure to, to, to dispose of Republican bills that, that weren't ready to pass. And so I expect that some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle remember that and will remember that. And so that will reduce my individual ambition to try and, and put in anything super uh, aggressive uh, this particular legislative session. Um, but like I said, I don't think that's a huge handicap to me because I don't know that, frankly, it would matter a whole lot um, given the, the the sort of stasis that we're in uh, with, with parties able, able to, to cancel each other out. Um, one other thing, and I'll open up to questions uh, for you all because uh, you uh, um, Sarah was nice enough to send me some questions in advance and things to, to, to sort of prime the conversation. Uh, I'm sure you all have been, hopefully you all have been following the redistricting um, situation in Virginia. I've been very involved with it really all summer long. Um, and actually going back to February of this year when we first met. So almost nine months out of my life and my reward is that I have no district. Um, it looks like at the end of this process. I mean, literally the, the district that where my house is, you yeah, know, my district gets some of it gets pushed over to Mark Keem's district. Some of it gets pushed over to, well, you all, the city of Falls Church gets stuck with uh, Patrick Hope. A big chunk of Maryfield goes down to Kay Corey. Um, so my district gets split sort of three different ways and none of which are really, um, so, so my options right now, if the, under the current maps, which the Supreme Court has produced, would have me, I'm at the very, very Eastern edge of my district, of, the, of district 12. Um, literally could walk a thousand feet out my backyard and be out. Markeem is literally on the very, very southwestern edge and could walk across 123 and he'd be out of his district. So we're both at the opposite end. So we'll see how these maps actually turn out. So where we are is, as you guys know, I'm sure that, that we had a commission that met over the summer. Um, I will say I take some satisfaction. I was down in Richmond on Friday um, as we were interviewing um, judges who were up for re-election and judicial candidates that would want to be elected judge next year. I ran into my friend, Senator Ryan McDougall, and I had to tell him, you know, if you had taken my offer, because I offered a number of different compromises. I offered some, I threw out some numbers there on, on things I thought we could live with and get to a, a compromise on, and he turned me down. Um, the numbers in the um, court-produced maps are better for Democrats even than what I offered. So um, he may be regretting his decision. I know that um, all the legislative members are regretting that we didn't get it worked out because what the court's done is paired up about 60 legislators out of 140 uh, will be paired in a district with another incumbent legislator uh, because the court and the special masters had no knowledge and frankly no interest in knowing where we lived um, and drew the districts without regard to where we live. Uh, and that's sort of the way the, uh, I would say cookie crumbled, but the way the pie got sliced. So, um, when the commission failed, I guess backing up a little bit, that, that caused the, the, the time to run out and that caused the Supreme Court to take responsibility for um, the redistricting process. Uh, both Republicans and Democrats had, were required to um, nominate 
three candidates to be special masters to draw the districts on behalf of the court. Courts, you, you don't have judges in their robes sitting around a table, you know, pulling out the mapping software, trying to do it. They always employ a special master um, to do the actual drawing, and then they guide them with, you know, the way the commission would have. Um, and so Democrats uh, appointed three university professors of political science, academics, uh, who sort of specialize in the science to the degree there's a science to redistricting. Um, Republicans uh, nominated three partisan um, political consultant types and advocates and so forth. And um, Democrats objected. The Supreme Court disqualified the initial slate of three Republican um, special master nominees and told them to go find three more. I would have preferred since they you know, didn't submit anybody qualified that we just go with the one Democrat, but I guess I didn't, that didn't happen that way. So they dominated three and the court found one of them acceptable. Um, and even though he works for a far right outfit called Real Clear Politics, um, but they had a 30 day deadline to produce maps. Um, as I expected, they got about halfway through their deadline and have produced an initial draft and submitted it to the court. And the court's now gonna hold two public hearings. So on December 15th, and again, on December 17th, if you guys haven't yet, you can go uh, sign up, uh, I'll drop something in the chat about how to sign up to testify and say that you wanna keep Falls Church City in with Fairfax County where Marcus can still be our delegate. We don't have to say that, but um, the uh, there's an opportunity to go ahead and, and, and take some public input. I know that the uh, House Democratic Caucus is gonna take advantage of that public input opportunity. And we're gonna submit an alternative map um, that actually has about the same uh, partisan breakdown. Uh, we didn't get super greedy about it, um, but configures the districts differently um, because we're a membership organization. So obviously we're gonna have a map that our members all have districts in. So give them some alternative ideas uh, about how they might um, do some of these districts that wouldn't change the partisan um, landscape a whole lot, but might keep communities of interest better because we had the opportunity to have people who actually live in the districts and walk and knock doors in them uh, give us input on what the communities of interest in their districts were. So you guys will get a chance to see that. And I, I think you'll be sort of surprised with how even-handed it is. And, and, and so hopefully the court special masters will look at it and at least glean, if they don't adopt the whole thing, uh, glean some ideas for how they might be able to redraw some of their districts. Um, it's really unclear. Nobody knows um, what the court will do after the public hearings. I mean, they may say, hey, we got some really good feedback here, things that we like, special masters, we'd like you to go back and revisit your maps. And you know, these are like the, the 10 things we heard that we really think you guys should try to address. Um, or they may say, look, we heard a lot of good, we heard a lot of bad, a lot of people like the maps, a lot of people don't like the maps. On balance, we think that they're fine. And they could just adopt the maps and, and not do a whole bunch more uh, to change them. And, and we don't know. Um, I think the special masters, they label them draft one. I think that they actually are expecting, it, it just, and this is just the sense that I have. I have no real basis for beyond that. But I think they're expecting to, to be able to use the, the, the public hearings to be meaningful, right? And the feedback to actually be something that they can go back and apply and then draw, you know, make some revisions. Um, will it be a wholesale revision or just some tinkering around the edges? I think more likely just tinkering, unfortunately. I don't think they're gonna go back and, and start over completely from scratch um, you know, on the basis of anything they hear during the public hearings. So that's where we are. Um, I will note from the City of Falls Church that the, the City of Falls Church got a mention in the memo, um, you know, in addition to submitting three maps, one for the congressional districts, one for the House, one for the Senate, um, the special masters you know, had a narrative to explain what they did, and they admitted in their memo that they struggled with where to put Falls Church, um, and whether it was made sense to put it in Arlington uh, or to keep it with Fairfax County. You know, geographically, it kind of looks funny, you know, jutting out into Fairfax, but you're also part of a judicial circuit with Arlington, um, and so there are other, you know, you got, you got a metro line that, that comes right through and goes on into Arlington, the Boston Corridor. So there are arguments certainly on both sides for that. Um, so we'll see if, if they try and revisit that. Um, it would make my wife's life easier. She'd love to move to the city. She'd be willing to move to the city of Falls Church. That's about as far, it's the only place she says she's willing to move for me, um, if that's what's necessary. She loves Falls Church City. She's like, I moved there, but anywhere else, um, she doesn't think so. So that's the current status of it. Again, there's one more opportunity, two more opportunities 
uh, for the public to weigh in. I hope that you guys will, uh, whatever, regardless of, of whether you think you want to keep me or not. I hope you guys will take advantage of the opportunity to weigh in uh, and share your thoughts on redistricting. And there's one final thing before I throw up a question. There's also a question, and I'm not particularly well versed in all the federal stuff. I can tell you that Falls Church City was featured uh, in Market Watch article uh, so a few weeks ago about how cities were you know, taking advantage of the ARPA money, this is the Rescue American Rescue Plan money, not the infrastructure money, um, to, to use it for infrastructure improvements. Um, I think the city of Falls Church will benefit um, in a lot of ways um, because a lot of the infrastructure money will be used to help uh, WMATA, which is in desperate need, frankly, of help on your know, big one-time expenses. Um, to get our trains so that they don't derail and, and to make some infrastructure repairs and continue to increase safety there. So a lot of it's going to Metro, which are useful for, for a city which is bookended by uh, two Metro stations. Um, the airports authority will get a big chunk of the infrastructure money uh, and that will help, I think, uh, you know, the city indirectly will benefit from that. Um, but it's hard to know yet. I haven't seen any kind of data about how much money will trickle right into the city's treasury for local infrastructure projects. So I don't have that answer for you yet, but I think it's something we're all keeping an eye on. Virginia did well. I mean, we got um, eight and a half billion dollars uh, in um, infrastructure money. So, um, hold on one second, I have a tab open on that. Yeah, uh, yeah, Virginia gets $8 billion in federal funds over the next five years. Um, and uh, the DC metro area, so we don't even get, you know, they break it down by Richmond, Lynchburg, Bristol, but it, it, DC, Maryland, Virginia gets 2.7 billion of that, um, including money for airports and WMATA. So that's what I've sort of prepared. I'm happy to riff on anything else that you guys want to talk about. Happy to take questions now. I use about half the time and leave about the other half for, for you guys. Unless no one has any questions. I know we have a lot of interest in City of Falls Church in um, increasing affordable housing and um, other initiatives to increase equity. Um, what, you know, are there, will you say something about the Commonwealth funds that might be available um, to City of Falls Church? Um, do they require a local match? What kinds of projects are most likely to be appealing to the, um, you know, to the Richmond decision makers there? And, um, and also, if you've seen any Virginia communities um, doing innovative things on affordable housing or increasing um, integrated housing, um, that would be really great to hear about too. So Virginia is actually what we um, has been, I think, the most successful state in the country at spending down our tenant relief funds. Um, so during the, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act and during the pandemic, uh, there were foreclosure prevention funds, there's, there's a big, there was a great deal of concern about a wave of evictions and a lot of folks losing their home. Um, and what we did is um, to keep that money flowing through, we, we adopted a program that, that required landlords um, to actually do the paperwork as opposed to the tenants. I uh, said, hey, we'll give you guys the money. We, there's plenty of money to ha be had, um, and, but we want you to make it really easy for the landlords to go to the tenants um, get the paperwork signed, and then they could get the funds directly. And we also used money from our affordable housing trust fund to prime the pump for that program. So we weren't waiting around for the federal funds. Um, so by the time when the federal funds showed up, we were able to get that money going. So we, we, we've spent um, far more uh, per capita than any other state. And we've been really good about using those funds on an emergency basis. Now, the question is, though, and the concern about that approach was you took money from our affordable housing trust fund for this sort of very acute need during the pandemic. But what about what do we do about our, our larger problem that's not going away uh, if and when the pandemic eventually goes away? And so, um, you know, there, there's um, one of the things we we're talking about spending some of this surplus money on is to pay back the affordable housing trust fund and build it up um, and get it more, make it more robust. Uh, and so I think you'll see that uh, happen. Um, and then, you know, I don't know that there's like a specific grant program or anything like that that's being worked on or developed. Um, I can certainly find out for you guys and get back to you, but I don't know that there's a, a quick and easy answer. Again, most of it's about maintaining the health of the affordable housing trust fund as opposed to creating new uh, programmatic things to spend the money on. Councilman Duncan. 
Phil. Hey, thanks. Sorry. Uh, at the risk of sounding clueless, I'll sound clueless. How are we going to provide a 10% match for teacher salaries, especially if we lose the grocery tax, which is a $1.4 million hit, and also uh, unrelated wholly, but also of interest? What's the situation with the state Senate districts for us? Gotcha. So um, the yeah, I think one of the things we're going to want to do with the budget, one is I think we're going to want to, if there's going to be a grocery tax repeal, I think that like the car tax repeal, well, I still pay a car tax. I think you guys still pay a car tax, but you guys remember the Jim Gilmore, you know, no car tax bumper stickers. That was a successful slogan. Um, there, there will have to be a, 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 if the state's going to take away one of your taxes, right now it's going to cut a tax of yours, not ours, then I think we have to make up the revenue to you all. So we have to give you the money for that. I mean, I, I don't know that anybody um, thinks we should just take the, revenue source away from localities without um, you know, making you whole for whatever your grocery tax would have been. How we calculate that and what I, I, whether you guys you know, do the paperwork as if you're collecting the grocery tax and give the bill to the state, kind of like we do with personal property tax. Um, but I certainly will be a big advocate for if we're going to target grocery tax like that. I think it's a fairly progressive approach to taxation, but if we're going to do it, the, the gov local governments like the city of Falls Church that have done land use planning and economic development premised on one set of rules in anticipation of being able to collect this revenue ought to be held harmless from the decision that we make there on, about what they can do and how they can tax things. Uh, so that, I, I, you know, hopefully we avoid the hit by just giving you the money. Um, if, if in fact, you know, there's the will to do that. Um, as for the 10% match, I think we need to, to try and, and see if we can't, um, soften the blow on that too. And I, I would support um, finding a way to make it more affordable uh, to localities to actually make sure teachers get the full, um, to get the full the refund. So we're gonna we'll be changing the proposal a little bit, using some of that surplus funds you know, to provide more aid and have the state pay a higher share of the new teacher pay and not run it all through the formula and make you match it. Um, so those are the things we look at. On the formula for teacher pay, I mean, I have a serious concern about a 10% across the board raise that it's going to be inequitable. I mean, you know, we already have um, inequity across school districts in Virginia. Uh, you know, Falls Church City teachers do a lot better than, you know, Richmond or I'm sure, you know, Hampton Road. I'm sure there's many, many other places in Virginia. And if you just increase teacher pay by 10% across the board, no matter what you're making, um, you know, based, based on what you're making today, you're just going to um really um exacerbate that inequity right it's a very sort of simple slow good slogan good uh a simple approach but maybe a more nuanced way to achieve the same idea which is to get teacher pay above the national average across the board but also make sure that places that are having more difficulty attracting and retaining teachers have what they need to do it would be a better approach um as for the senate districts i did sort of just so one of the things that the special master did masters did was they um they decided to try and they'd like to try and nest districts. So they, they started with the congressional districts. Part of the reason my district got blown up the way it did. They started doing the 11 congressional. Then they tried to fit the Senate districts inside to the, as best they could. That's not a, the right number because there's 40 and there's 11. So it doesn't divide. But try to you know, fit their, their Senate dis districts inside of congressional districts. And then try and fit as many House districts as they could sort of as close to inside of the Senate districts as possible. So City of Falls Church winds up with Arlington, North Arlington, in both the House and the Senate map, which would have you all in a district where I think Patrick Hope currently is, although only by about a block or two, um, and then Barbara Favola um, would be so it'd be a mostly North Arlington, uh, well, most, uh, most of Arlington, actually, a good chunk of North Arlington, Crystal City, I think goes down to the Pentagon, Crystal City, uh, and the City of Falls Church in the Senate. So, um, Although Dick Sassel is likely to retire anyway, um, you'd be in a more favola Senate district and a, probably a hope, depending on what he decides to do, um, House district, again, or if somebody else decides to run. But that's that's what the, it looks like. And then remains in the eighth uh, congressional district with Don Byer. Um, the, the, the interesting things they did on the congressional map, um, surprising things, they moved the seventh district into Prince William. So they decided to, to do three. Um, districts in Virginia. So they have an Arlington, Alexandria, Fairfax. Well, they have an Arlington, Alexandria district, which is the eighth, 
right? Arlington Alexander Alexander State goes inside the Beltway Fairfax County pieces. Uh, and that's almost entirely sort of the inner Beltway, and that's the Don Byer district. Uh, they got mostly a Fairfax County district then for Jerry Connolly, got most of the rest of Fairfax County. And then they used they did a Loudoun based and a Prince William based district. So instead of doing a Loudoun and Prince William together, they used Loudoun and then went sort of south and west down through Culpeper Orange to almost to Charlottesville, but stopped just short of Charlottesville. Um, and then they have a Prince William East District that goes all of Prince William County east into the Northern Neck, uh, which is the new seventh, it was the old first, but um, that, that, that looks like it could be a potential Democratic uh, seat there. Um, and then you've got the, the question is a lot Abigail Spamberger move up from the Richmond suburbs up to Fredericksburg to try and run in her 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 old number anyway, which would be the seventh, or does she uh yeah do something different? Um so the um uh, the congressional maps, this is what I was saying earlier. You know, I think I had offered we got by the end we were getting impatient with each other, we just threw out the numbers. I think I offered um a six four two map, and I think that. That's roughly what we had. They wanted a five five one, and I think we roughly have a six four two map from the special masters. So um, they could have accepted my offer, and we could have you know, actually worked on it together, um, and, and they probably would have come out the same. I think the offer that George and I had on on Senate districts was after we went back and took drew the, draw the maps, then go back and look at what the political outcome is and see if we need to make any adjustments. And I think we had said we'd take you know twenty, we'd like twenty two to. Uh, 18, we take 21, 19. I think that the score that the special master's map has is 23 Democratic seats. I think like 16 Republican and a bunch of competitive ones in there. So, you know, we weren't, it's good to know I wasn't being unreasonable. You never know in these situations whether you're being reasonable or not, but it sounds like the things we were offering uh, the court, or the special master seemed to think were, were reasonable. I just wish we could have come together and then we might not have quite so many uh, incumbent overlapping districts if we had some maintain some control over the process. Anything else? So let's see. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe something on the environment. I know there's some interest in things well, like the plastic more... tax and I don't know how much how much of that stuff is just gonna yeah. get so we've gone the, wrong, gone the wrong way already on the environment. And one of the first things that Governor Youngkins announced is that he will use his executive authority to pull us out. I mean, it's, a, it's sort of Trump light. I, and I know that that was an effective campaign slogan. And I know that was an effective strategy. But that said, you know, one of the first things that Donald Trump did when he took office was pull us out of the the, uh, the, the climate accords, the, the Paris Accords. Well, Glenn Young's already announced that he's going to pull Virginia out of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. This is a you know, multi-state compact of folks that are trying to um, you know work together to reduce carbon emissions and set targets and goals and things like that and he's first thing he's already said is that once he's governor by executive order he'll pull us out of that so um while there might be some bipartisan support uh for for env good environmental legislation and there has been uh in the past um i, I think one of the ways that governor the governor youngkin wants to establish his his Trumpian kind of bona fides uh, is on the environment for whatever reason. Um, so I'm not terribly sanguine about the opportunities to, to move the ball forward there. I think we're gonna be playing some defense on stuff like that, to be honest. Um, I do think the infrastructure, so back to the federal infrastructure, but it does provide some money for electric charging infrastructure. And I know as I, I've, got, I've gone all electric, I have an Audi e-tron and uh, I get up and down to Richmond and I know the, all the good high-speed charging stops along the way in Fredericksburg, well, Garrisonville, Fredericksburg and, and then there's one in Parham Road. I wish there were a few in between because every now and then I forget because I'm on the phone and I miss the one that I meant to go to and then I've got a bare knuckle drive um, to the next one to make sure, or I have to decide to turn around. So I'd love to see high-speed charging stations at every exit, the way you have a gas station uh, at almost every exit. And I think there's we're moving in that direction. I also find that I have a lot more company at the charging stations than I used to um, as more and more all electric vehicles uh, roll out that have the capacity. The, for those of you that are, are, don't know about the, have never driven an all electric, um, there are high speed, there are now 150 kilowatt and 350 kilowatt ones. They can add, I can add 60 miles, uh, actually, I can add about 80 miles, I would say, in about six minutes. 
um, which again, to get you back and forth to Richmond, it's, it, yeah, it's like a gasoline stop. It's enough time to plug in, go inside, use the restroom, come out, unplug. And I've got all that I need now to make it a round trip pretty comfortably, even if I didn't start with a full, um, a full tank, but a full battery uh, when I left. But um, range anxiety is no big deal. If you know that, it can, you can add 60 miles in five minutes and there's every 40 or 50 miles or even every 10 or 20 miles, if you miss one, there's going to be a place to go charge up. So I think the infrastructure is going to be the key to greater adoption of the, and the speed there. So if I can get 150, I can get 80 miles in six minutes. You know, 350 is, you know, double and a little bit more of that, right? So in about three minutes, you can do that. So uh, we're getting there. So it's almost comparable to putting gas in your tank. Will there be any hope to do anything more for farm workers or is that in the too hard to do? Um, I doubt that there'll be any real progress on labor stuff, but to even farm workers, because um, right, they were exempted from some of our, our, our uh, minimum wage bills and some of our labor uh, things that we've done. Uh, and with the thought being that we'd come back and help out. Uh, I don't think there's probably much hope this session for that. I mean, it's certainly worth revisiting, but I don't know that you'll get a lot. But speaking of things, I guess, that were left undone, what will be interesting to see is how we um, deal with marijuana legislation. Uh, because I don't think, you know, we've legalized marijuana in Virginia. Uh, we've legalized it under a certain amount and, and allowed people to grow it at home, but we haven't finished um, establishing the regulations for a retail marketplace. And although Republicans may not be, have been wild about legalizing marijuana in the first place, they don't have the votes um, to put that genie back in the bottle, right? So we're not going to recriminalize marijuana. So we do need, at this point, to figure out how to establish a legal um, marketplace for it. Uh, and what the best way to do that is to create an ABC-like board, a marijuana control board, or do we make the ABC responsible for marijuana? Um, so that will you know, continue to move forward on a bipartisan basis. Uh, I think it'll be a more Republican flavor of that, right? We had initially wanted and hoped to um, create something called equity licenses, like they've done in Massachusetts, where we give preferential treatment um, to uh, communities that have been you know, disproportionately impacted by the criminalization of marijuana. Um, I don't I know what the statute of limitations is or not, but you know, having grown up just outside Falls Church in McLean and knowing a lot of people in Falls Church City, I mean, the kids I grew up with all smoked marijuana without much fear of the police, because if we did get caught, we'd hire lawyers and we had bright futures ahead of us and nobody wanted to jam us up too bad for the rest of our lives. And we usually found a way to deal with it. Whereas, uh, communities in South Arlington, people that were Hispanic or Black would be stuck with criminal records, right? And so to, to try and figure out how we kind of you know, rebalance that now that marijuana is legal, we were going to try and you know, uh, place the retail establishments in neighborhoods that have been targeted by over-policing, give preference to uh, people that have been impacted by it. I don't think you'll see any of that from Republicans. I, yeah, I, I don't think that they have much interest in using the, the the legalization of marijuana as an opportunity to try and level that playing field. Um, I think you'll see more traditional kind of licensing requirements uh, and less of our, what they would describe as, as wokeness. Um, that's not how I describe it. I'm just saying that's how they would describe it uh, in the process. So um, it'll be, that'll be something that'll continue. Basically asking folks that don't really believe in it um, to, to implement it. And so that's always an interesting challenge. I want to raise a question that came into our email inbox, um, which um, dealt with the number of people that are wearing um, AirPods and other kinds of headphones while they're driving, and what will the legislature do to um, encourage safe driving, and in particular, um, the potential of banning, um, you know, earpieces while you're driving. Well, that's always an interesting one. I mean, it took us forever, believe it or not. I mean, it took us until I think last year, the year before to finally in, implement a hands-free bill where you couldn't, where it was actually illegal to be holding a device in your hand while you were driving. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. There, there's a coalition of folks that, that oppose those things. Um, it's an interesting coalition, but you're far Western or rural or um, rural folks that don't want you know, anybody telling them what to do. They are opposed to seatbelt laws, opposed to child safety seat laws opposed to you know, banning kids riding in the back of pickup trucks. So they just want the police to leave us alone, let parents figure out what we can do and, and don't do. Um, 
And then you have inner city uh, African-American Black Caucus members uh, that are concerned that these provide pretexts, additional pretexts for over-policing and, and, and um, discretionary stops. Uh, and that's what slowed down the hands-free bill. Uh, so it was a pretty delicate compromise to, to get that done. So I, I think um, to go back and say, you know, cause I'm wearing AirPods, suppose I'm wearing a, a Bluetooth headset that connects to my, um, but my car when I'm in the car, but when I, when I get out of my car, I continue on my headset. So I want to leave it on. Right. Um, I just think I, I don't suspect uh, that there'll be any, I can be convinced that I'm wrong, that there's more to this that I, I realize that there's some data behind it. Uh, I'd be happy to be educated by my, my instinct without having really thought about it much before is that would be a difficult thing to navigate through the general assembly. Hey, does anybody else in the audience have a question? Barbara unmuted. Yeah, just just have one question and that this being the league, you know, we're obviously very concerned with voting rights legislation. And I just wondered if you had any final comments on that. Do you think Virginia will be able to retain the good legislation that was passed in that area over the last couple of years? I, I do. I, I think that, um... What you know, some of the things that, that Glenn Youngkin was calling for as initiatives are things that we already do. Um, you know, we we do logic and there's uh, there's another word for it, but they would test the machines, logic and accuracy testing. Um, we actually run them through that kind of an audit. We do an uh, uh, an audit where we you know, a math based statistical audit just to make sure there know that that everything that all the results are within. There's no statistical anomalies, right? And just by applying mathematical principles and things like that. So they'll probably um, you know, by regulation, they may have some of those things happen more frequently or something just by, you know, to have the, because they'll control the state board of elections. The governor's party, um, gets the majority on every board of elections and the state board, it's now five. So they'll get three and we'll get two. Um, your local board here in Falls Church City will have to have two people from the, the governor's party, even though he got, I think, 25% of the vote here. Um, he still gets two out of three of our, electoral board members in the city of Falls Church. So, um, but anyway, I think they'll, they'll do something like that. Uh, the, I think we'll have a mandate that, that we sort of resisted um, on um, requiring absentee ballots to be sorted by um, precinct. Um, I think that's a software issue. I think we figured out Fairfax has kind of demonstrated how to do that. Uh, as I think did uh, Norfolk. So I think we've got a couple of localities that already figured that out. So we'll mandate it now that you guys have figured it out. I'll tell you now you all have to do it. Um, I think again, it'll be, I'll be watching if, if I'm still in privileges and elections, even if I'm not, I'll be watching to make sure we do that in a, in a smart way that avoids unintended consequences because the language, the bill that was introduced last year um, would have literally required registrars to sort them in physical, you know, physically separate them into precincts and deliver them somewhere, keep them together. You can do all that with, you know, the, the counting can be done electronically. You can just maintain that sort electronically. So figuring out the details of that will be probably something where there's some consensus on because we all have the same desire. Frankly, as politicians, we love data. We love to know to the best, as best we can where our votes are coming from and where we're strong, where we're weak. Uh, if we can get that on a you know, streetwide basis, you know, we'd, we'd love to know which streets we need to knock. So I think that'll happen. I think that there'll be a bill introduced to repeal, um, you know, to re-implement voter ID, a vote, mandatory photo voter ID. I don't think that'll pass the Senate. I mean, that'll kill that. Uh, there'll be bills to probably reduce the amount of absentee voting. I, I don't think that'll pass. Um, I do think Republicans have realized that some of the stuff we've done is, you know, doesn't disadvantage them or doesn't advantage us, depending on how you want to look at it, as much as they thought. Like, hey, wait a second, if we actually just embrace it and encourage people to vote, we got a lot of infrequent voters too. And our infrequent voters can, if we make it easy for them to vote, um, that's good for everybody. So I think that, um, you know, they're, they're, some of their fears about, you know, increased turnout, you know, didn't turn out to work against them this time. So they may back off uh, of some of the issues they've opposed historically. So that's my hope anyway. But yeah, I think on elections there, there was, I mean, um, we, we did a lot in two years. We did a lot in two years. And there, there, there are a few things left to, to be done, but most of them, uh, I guess if we can just maintain what we've got uh, and continue to, to um, weed out you know, unintended consequences or, or tweak things to improve the system, 
Um, that, that's probably the most we'll want to do this time around. Campaign finance would be an interesting place too to see if there's some consensus, um, given that you know um, Republicans saw how much more money Democrats were able to raise in the majority and that they had that to overcome. They may be all, if, if they think we're heading back to the majority, uh, there may be some bipartisan interest in, in uh, doing a few things on campaign finance reform. I think my bill on banning personal use of campaign funds probably will pass this time around. I think uh, that was pretty well vetted during our uh, commission process. Uh, and I think we addressed a lot of the concerns that senators had about it last time around. And they've had some time to think about it. So some minor, I, I, you know, not, not major, major campaign finance reform, but I think some modest campaign finance reform stuff might be something to look at uh, as an area of, of potential compromise um, as well. Can I ask about what we might be able to do um, to uh, on the climate proposal to pull out of the regional pact? I mean, so we actually never got that passed as legislation. And so it was, it was budget language, which is why when this budget goes away, you know, the governor will have the ability to, to take us out of it. Um, yeah, I mean, the only thing we could do would be to pass legislation you know, that require Virginia um, you know, have membership in, in, in Art Reggie. And again, with the votes the way where they are now, um, I mean, it's, certainly it's worth making an effort and doing so. I'm sure there'll be a bill introduced and I would love to, all, uh, when, when we get a bill and a patron, um, love to involve you all uh, in the advocacy process for it. Um, but, uh, you know, at the very least, you know, make it difficult on them uh, to kill it and, and know who, who, who was responsible for it so they can be held accountable at the ballot box next time. But I'm not, you know, I, I, I hard for me to imagine a, a path forward for it uh, this session. Thanks. Well, listen, it's been great chatting with you guys. We've used up almost the entire hour. Um, but unless there's anything else, I've got another Zoom starting in like five minutes. It'll give me a chance to uh, get a drink of water before I have to turn on my other camera. Thank you very much, Marcus. Thank you so much for your time. And we, we really appreciate your talking to us. And thanks so much, both Council Member Duncan and Council Member John Siscott, who uh, joined a few minutes after the introduction. Um, but we really appreciate talking with everyone today. Yeah, my and fingers are fine to district. Yeah, my fingers are crossed that the, the, the Supreme Court changes the maps enough that I have a district at the end of this whole process. We'll see. Maybe I'll be back next year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for joining. Bye-bye.